very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Diederik Jekyll, and the title of my presentation is indeed The Dangers of Fear. And um, the, when the people of TEDx asked me to give a presentation about human nature, I thought, well, I'm a physicist, how is that going to work? And then I thought, well, I am always been, I've always been fascinated by fear, and I'm not talking about legitimate fear, because these crazy people for some reason let a bull loose in the city streets, were surprised that he was angry for some reason and decided to climb the building. Um, so this is quite legitimate fear, and fear in itself is, is of course not a bad thing. I mean, it is guided as well, and the Neanderthals who saw a rattling snake and said, ooh, that's cute, I'll take it home as my pet and call it Fluffy, were quickly removed from the gene pool. Um, same goes for the people exploring the cave with the glowing eyes and the roar coming out of it. So fear is in itself not a bad thing. What I'm talking about is fear that um, is not legitimate, fear that is um, not necessary, and that can cost human lives, um, prevent solutions to be found. And I, I, I want to talk about this. And um, <clears throat> first of all, what is fear? Um, fear is a negative sensation or emotion you feel with a risk assessment. And risk assessment sounds very corporate -y, but you do that every moment of your lives. When you cross the street, for instance, you decide what risk there is. And what is the definition of risk? Risk is the chance of something nasty happening, multiplied, by how nasty the thing is. That's basically what risk is. So when you cross the street, you look to your left, you look to your right, and if you're British, you probably look to your right and then to your left. I don't exactly know how that works. But you decide no bus is coming. So the chances of being hit by a bus is very low. Don't get me wrong, it's very nasty to be hit by a bus. But the chances are so low that you decide, well, I, I shouldn't be afraid to cross the street. So basically, you do that in every aspect um, of your lives. And what I'm talking about is what happens next. So, fear is the emotion that comes with the risk assessment. But um, when we were Neanderthals and you were walking across the savannah and you saw a lion, the one thing you should do is run away. So the fear guides you there, and that makes perfect sense. The problem is if you don't look where you're going, you might run into a ravine, and then you're not better off. So the, the basic uh, storyline of, of what I'm about to, to tell you is that um, because the world is becoming so much larger and the problems are so much larger and more complicated, that it's in fact a very bad thing to be just guided by fear because it, it, it destroys sensible discussions. It's just yes or no. Um, you cannot find solutions because you're afraid of a bigger thing than maybe the problem itself. And you might end up substituting this problem, which you were afraid of in the first place, for something we should be even more afraid of. So, I'm trying to, to sort of get back from the ah, and go towards the mm, let's think about it. So, for instance, very simple when it can cost lives. When the Large Hadron Collider, the particle accelerator in Switzerland, was turned on, people were afraid that tiny black holes would, be, uh, would emerge inside the particle accelerator. And um, actually, a girl in India committed suicide because she, was, she couldn't handle the fact that everything she held dear or everything she loved would be destroyed by the crazy scientists in Switzerland. And the best experimental evidence we have that this won't happen is the simple fact that the Earth and the Moon have been here for about four billion years, and particles with massively more energy have hit the Earth and the Moon constantly. And no black holes were created. And if you are sort of doubting that fact, and you're wondering, has the Large Hadron Collider destroyed the Earth yet? You can always visit www.hastelargehadroncolliderdestroyedtheearthyet.com. And there you see the answer. And this is, by the way, from last week. I haven't checked it since. But I guess we're OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so. Um, when the problems get more complicated, for instance, with nuclear energy, and I'm not here to say um, nuclear energy is the bomb, and, okay, that's a bad choice of words. Nuclear energy is wonderful or it's a bad thing. I mean, that's a societal debate. That's something we as a society should decide. For me, I think it's okay to leave them open, but if we decide we should close them, that's okay. But we have to think about why are we doing this? Because it's scary? But what is the risk and what do you want to solve? Do you 
Are you worried about the legacy for our children, like uh, nuclear waste? Okay, that is fine. Uh, it's a very good reason, actually. But at this point in time, solar and wind energy are not yet ready to um, substitute the 13 to 14 percent of the total global electricity produ uh, production, which is done by nuclear power plants. So you have to do it with coal, which gives you fine dust, or CO2, which is a global warming gas issue problem. And that's also something we give to our children. Um, if you're worried about the people or the lives that get lost during an accident, well, think about the thousands of people every year dying inside a coal mine, or the people dying from fine dust. So again, I'm not here to say, yay, nuclear power. I'm just trying to make the discussion not so much between Greenpeace and pro-nuclear people who say yes or no and repeat. I'm just trying to, to ask everybody to think about what the risks are and try to come to an understanding of why person A says the risk is this and person B says the risk is that. And the same thing can go wrong with nanotechnology. Nanotechnology has every ingredient to be a fear-based discussion instead of a risk-based discussion. Don't get me wrong, nanotechnology will be the next revolution. You had steam engines, then you had computers, and now you have nanotechnology in the 21st century. It will come into every aspect of our lives, and it will do wonderful things. There are some aspects we should be very careful of. But when people think about nanotechnology, they think, oh, it's, 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 it's very tiny, it's scary, it's everywhere. Um, and you don't really look at the products which might cause a problem. I mean, your computer is one lump, one box of nanotechnology. And as long as you don't eat the computer, you're quite safe. <laughs> Same goes for, instance, uh, a nano filter, which can clean water in Africa because it has holes tinier than, the, than viruses, for instance. And the holes in those nano filters won't come loose any more than the holes inside your coffee filter. So again, it's just a matter of going away from the fear and just think about where are we running. So it, understand what you're running from and know where you're running to. So to sum up, it is very difficult with the problems we have today to really understand what the risks are. But, um, Try to understand the risk, and, and most of these talks end with a question to the audience. And please, when you find yourself in something you find frightening, or you hear something on TV that people are screaming about and because of fear, then think about what are the aspects that we should really be afraid of. And politicians and scientists and journalists such as me have an obligation to try to start communicating in a different way. Not the patriarchal way that we were used to, don't be afraid but explain why not, because people won't accept it anymore. The information that comes to them via Google or Twitter has been filtered by friends or corporations, so they hear what they want to hear. So we have to adjust the way we're communicating with each other. And I hope that the next time that you're afraid, you really look at the problem and try to understand it. And my experience, I've been a very scared boy when I was very small, and later on, when I started to understand what was going on, I became less and less frightened, and I've never been frightened for a very long time. Thank you very much.